Are you wanting to create a highly prosperous photography business doing what you love? Or maybe you have a great business already and want to up your game? Then you're in the right place. Master craftsman photographer Lucy Dumas and her guests are here to support you on your journey. Now here's your hostess and tour guide, Lucy. Every artist dips his brush in his own soul and paints his own nature into pictures. And that is a quote by Henry Ward Beecher. And who I love that. So welcome again to The Profitable Photographer. I am Lucy and I'm with Carly Sullins. Before we get started, I want to um, invite you to watch or listen to the podcasts on YouTube. And it would be a huge favor if you would simply subscribe. You don't get any pressure. You know, nobody starts pounding <laughs> pounding on your door trying to sell you anything. Um, one of the reasons is I'm trying to get enough uh, subscribers so I can have a custom URL so it's easier for everyone to find and log into. So it's you can just go to the Profitable Photographer in YouTube and um, watch. If you're listening right now, you can see the lovely Carly Sullins. And if I'm having a good hair day, you can check that out. <laughs> All right. So let me tell you about our guest. And she's she's offering a perspective and something really exciting that I haven't covered much in my show, which is about creativity and pushing our photographs as far as they can go. So Carly is a major award-winning professional photographer, artist, digital painter, and she teaches us how to do what she does. She's got a master's degree in art, and she has studied painting, psychology, art history, and oils, watercolors, acrylics, all of what you would imagine in an art degree. And then she began to add photography and then she merged the two. So um, you should go check out her work on her painting page, which you can see how to get there in the show notes because her work is amazing. Um, so she says her work is an encounter between both the painting and photography. And she wants to share or she loves to explore how photographs can be deconstructed and then transformed into a new reality. So Carly, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So can you tell me briefly, I mean, we covered a lot, but how you got, how you, like, what was your calling as an artist or why, you know, do you have a little quick background or what you were yeah. like as a three-year-old? I think art has always been a part of my life ever since I received that first Crayola box with a sharpener in the back. Mm -hmm. um, I was hooked. Um, and I recognized at a very early age that art had power. Um, it had power to know yourself. It also had power to connect with the world around you. Mm. And I, that never left me. So all through growing up, I always dappled in the art, um, took art in high school. And then I pursued a degree in art therapy where we had to take psychology classes and fine art classes. And we had to understand um, how different art material uh, evokes things inside people both physically and emotionally like clay when you touch clay it's it's wet it's soft and that is a more fluid material versus mm -hmm. pencil it's more sharp and you have more control over it so understanding different art mediums will evoke different things from different people which I, I find fascinating ah, yeah I've never thought about that about like I I took uh ceramics in college to for fun and I still miss that feeling yeah. of as as you're trying to make something symmetrical and then you put your finger in and you pull that up and that feeling is so satisfying 
Yeah. And um, the even the difference, like, do you think the difference between film photography and digital is as profound and different? Sure, because in film photography, if you go and develop your film, you have that moment where you see that image coming out right there in front of you in a in a tray, which mm -hmm. is powerful to see what your eyes saw come forth in that way. Whereas digital, when you upload your images, it's right there immediately, right in front of you. Right, right. I I was telling somebody because uh, I don't photograph as much. Uh, Carly, I've been in this business for 40 years. I did full-time weddings for 12 and then kids and families. And uh, now I do more coaching and, you know, this podcast uh, is super fun, but okay, where was I going? Um, I think I would still be doing more photography if I could hand my film off and not have to do everything it takes to download and edit and sort, you know, that first, here they are, here are proofs, or in the old days, we used to get um, slides that were mm -hmm. proofs. So I got, I got that moment where I clicked that I got the excitement, if everything fell into place. And then the next time I saw the work, uh, you know, it was pretty much ready to show my clients and sell. So interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, go ahead. So photography is a wide span of where people feel they're most comfortable in that their lane. And I think that's important to recognize because some photographers do like the editing part more so than taking the actual photograph. And then there's people like you that like going out and taking the actual photograph. And both are are part of our artistry and we have a wide range to you know create the art we want to with photography um but as a an, an artist i fall over on the editing side where mm -hmm. i love to deconstruct my photos and spend time sometimes weeks on just one photo mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually this is i'm enjoying this thank you um because part of why photography was that, you know, God coming down from the heavens to say, this is your path. Because uh, I did, I painted and I had the 64 box of crayons, <laughs> you know, with the little sharpener. And I'd always been in search of a medium and the immediacy of photography and not having to spend a bunch of time creating the work is what drew me. So you mm -hmm. just... You just cleared something up for me about why, because um, I have a lot of friends who really are into the artistry, you know, the aftercare, and I've been like, huh, why, why am I not so into that? And it's that very thing. So ding, ding, ding. I don't know if it helps anyone else, but <laughs> you've just cleared up something for me of my, my why, because it's that, like the first time I had a good camera uh in my hand and I was able to photograph what what my mind and my heart always wanted to be able to photograph it was that defining uh -huh. moment and um yeah so thank you for that You're welcome. all right so I have some official questions all right one of the things you love to do and teach is to push the artistic potential so can you talk about that what do you mean by that um, I, I believe we are in a new renaissance. Um, the renaissance was a time, it wasn't just art, it was also science, it was also Shakespeare, mm. poetry. Um, all these forefronts were pushing the boundaries during that time and we were just exploding. Um, and that's the same thing that's happening in our lifetime right now, even though it's hard to see because we don't have that step back to look at it. But if you look at like the Tesla and if you look at science and biomedical, like you could put a prosthetic on someone's arm and their brain can talk to it and move their fingers like a real hand, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, 
And then you look at art, art hasn't changed much for centuries except digital art, which is changing leaps and bounds every day. Um, so I like to push the boundaries of digital photography because we, we are in this sector too. Regardless if you're just changing exposure or white balance your photo, you're still doing a digital application. Mm -hmm. There is no defined line that says this is where you stop and this is where you can go. That whole area is free for all of us to explore. And we get to choose how we want to explore our art in any way we want mm -hmm. to. So you just blew my mind again. <laughs> uh, this is why I love doing this podcast, because um, I love to learn and I love to think new thoughts. And uh, you just installed a lot of new thoughts in my brain here. So the big explosion in this is when digital started becoming more common and at PPA, you're, you've entered and you're part of Professional Photographers of America, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yep. So I was kind of like on my high horse. These aren't photographs. You know, this person that got a hundred took eight photographs and put them together. How is that fair? And, you know, it's at this point, point what I'm hearing is well that was just pre-renaissance and we it's like that's over that that you can still get a great score and make people really happy with a clean photograph not clean like as in digital art right. is dirty but with with a out of camera with traditional adjustments and you can make something completely different and it's all good it's all art it is and this is an ongoing conversation that is bigger than us and it's something that we need to continually touch base on um in print competitions because it is a different type of photography and a different type of editing mm -hmm. and I say that because I sit there but I also recognize the talent it takes to create a beautiful photo that you sat there waiting for an animal to come in the landscape and that is its own artistry too and should be judged accordingly mm -hmm. so as we go forward as digital art keeps exploding and you know and it touches on PPA and judging and where are the boundaries within photography, this is a dialogue that we need to keep talking and touching base on and figuring out how do we best judge all these photos together. Right, right. I always hope that that there's a separate um, category if something was primarily a composite sure. versus a, a camera, I mean, a photograph where you picked the background, you picked the lighting, you put the details. Um, but I, I'm not upset about it anymore, whatever it is, because I still see beautiful people like, do you know, Pete Rizek? I think, yeah. Because, so he's doing incredible black and white photography, like, you know, and he's, he scores it so high with his work and it's, it's, you know, it's classic. And so mm -hmm. nothing is pushing anything else out of the way. You know, it's all, right. uh, I'm guessing it's similar to when photography came into the art world and there was so much uh, conversation about whether it was art. And, sure. fear and, it, that, and it's funny because the painters felt threatened by the photographers. And now as a photographer, I'm bringing my photography back to painting and the photographers start feeling that threat of the digital art coming back and taking right. over the photography. So it's this, this evolving dance that we play and, and I feel there is room for all of it. And mm -hmm. um, and I am thankful for PPA for re recognizing that more so than any other print competition that's national because they, they allowed it in the beginning. They allow the space for this new type of artistry to be judged mm -hmm. and looked at and be a part of the photography world because the foundation is photography right right and the foundation of art is the same no matter what the medium does it have impact yes. does yes. it make you feel something is it well crafted or if it's not well crafted does that still make it i mean does that enhance 
the response to it that um so you know design principles people are always like i'm i'm not a rule follower like the rule of thirds and fibonacci's what what yep. is that swirly thing spiral yep yeah um but as humans um i'm guessing you would agree with me if you don't let me know but there's there's something in a in our brains in our makeup that sees and is pleased by certain forms, certain compositions, certain alliance, you know, objects uh, in relationship or in contrast, you know, color harmonies, tones, all of that. There's something as humans that uh, is is just born in us. And sure. so that rule of third to me is, it's good to know about it and use it when you want to, because it does feel good to look at as a human. Do you, do you know what I mean? Or do you have any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. We are, it comes from a place of survival. We like symmetry mm -hmm. because symmetry equals health. And um, there's a reason and we like balance. And so when we take things out of balance, our mind is more engaged because we're looking we want the symmetry and now we're engaged in looking so purposely making things out of balance or using rules a third is helping draw people into the art mm. i mean even thinking because so many times when i'm judging uh especially if it's something like fine art or i mean abstract is so often i will critique something that didn't quite uh you know grab me that there's no center of interest. And mm -hmm. I just thought, okay, as a survivor, when we're out in the world, we're trying to find either where's the danger or where's the thing I want to go towards. So yep. yeah, I, I've i noticed one of my favorite ways to get a child to respond to me is to hold up a ball or to pull a ball on my head. And I yes. don't, you know, these are, pre-verbal humans that yeah. respond to a, a cylindrical object and you know it'd be so uh, curious to understand why on that but you know shapes impact us as well I guess is yes is what I'm saying or maybe we're we see earth and we're way out in space and as we come we see the ball and then we're there and we're like oh it's home I don't know do you have thoughts about why a ball or you know why a shape like vertical makes us feel energy and square or circle makes us feel love horizontal is peace it, it, there's studies on different shapes you know uh, and how they evoke different emotions there's also studies on universal symbols like the spiral is a universal symbol a circle is a universal symbol you'll see it all through time all through art which i find very fascinating mm-hmm yeah, ooh, so that was actually one of my questions. So, sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, so when you see that, you're engaged in it, even though you may not consciously be aware of that, why that's happening. Mm -hmm. But there are certain symbols that will engage you and pull you in for certain yeah. reasons. Yeah. So one of my questions for you was, where do people learn about this? Like, let's say I suddenly wake up one day and I want to be uh, spending weeks on one photograph and I would want to be putting symbols in. I would want to be not just throwing things in because I think it looks good, but also doing what master artists over probably since cave paintings uh, understood the meaning of symbolism. So how do how do we learn that? I think the best answer answer I can give is um, to look within. Mm. And I know that sounds, you want an external answer and I'll give you that too. I think in our day and age, we are so pulled outside of ourselves, social media, our phones beeping, the television. Um, we don't have a time in our life like we used to before, you know, um, a kid from 
you know, the seventies where you would have to sit quietly or have a book or just be, sorry, just be bored. Um, and I think to tap into your, your art resources is to spend quiet time with yourself. Mm. Mm. And then once you do that, the symbols come to you. Oh. And how you know those symbols come to you because they keep showing up. Certain symbols, certain things evoke stuff in me that keep showing up in my art over and over again. And that's mm. going to be different for you and different for anyone else. We, we might have simpler symbols like uh, I love water. I swim a lot. So I love having water in my art and someone else might have water in their art, but it might be a different reason and a different purpose and uh, a different visual representation of water. Wow. Once you yeah. sit and you, you start being aware of these symbols or things that are drawn to you, you're drawn to and they're drawn to you, then you can go and create them. I'm trying to take a little notes because this is so good. Um, you know, and yeah, and that's something when, well, I suppose in looking at what I might photograph over and over again, there are lessons in that for me about what I'm drawn to. Yes. Um, it, that's one of the reasons I became a children's photographer is even my first big event with a good camera was a trip to Europe in my 20s. And when I came back, I noticed so many of my images didn't just have the cathedral, but a child doing something within that environment. Mm. Or, uh, you know, I have one where a child, a little German or Austrian boy in almost traditional, like lederhosen almost, mm -hmm. stomping around uh, a fountain. And, you know, I thought I was taking a picture of the fountain, but then I was so drawn to, to this little boy. And still, like, it's hard for me not to be working full time with kids because just being around children brings me joy they're my thing so yeah, yeah interesting now are there like when my first husband uh was he was an art major and he would come home and he would tell me some of the specifics that he learned like uh if there's a dog in a painting it means faithfulness and um if there's an arch there's a meaning and he also taught me uh that if you notice paintings of important people who are unattractive, have the most elaborate, beautiful clothing. Now that's not a symbol, but right. you know, it was so interesting. So um, thoughts on that, or is there like a um, like a list of meanings within meanings that are there traditionally are. understood by painters? Or there are. A list of what symbols in your art could mean but uh in my art therapy training the most important meaning is the one the artist attached to it okay so yeah. regardless if there's a list out there how your connection with that symbol is what trumps it all what's most important i always remember the art therapy teacher saying that uh there was a kid in treatment and he drew a black Christmas tree and everyone was like why is the Christmas tree black what does this mean what happened around Christmas for this poor child and then finally someone asked them why did you color your Christmas tree black and the child said that was the only crayon that wasn't broken <laughs> so it's important to you know as the artist you get to attribute the meaning and the symbols and you might not even know symbols come to you and you might not even know for years what that symbol meant right right um, and then the viewer we get to attach our own meaning to art and that's what makes art such a beautiful poetry back and forth visually back and forth mm. yeah and every time we look at it we're in a different space yes so it means something different um yes. one of my loan collection prints I think it's called something else now, image of excellence or something. Uh -huh. um, I was at a lake and it was one of the few times I've gotten up before sunrise because uh, I'd heard that the mist uh, 
would rise and make all kinds of beautiful pastel colors. And the water was completely flat. And so I threw, I wanted a ripple. Now I'm not a good thrower. So I had to throw a lot of rocks, but uh-huh. I got one where it was the perfect ripple. And to oh. me, that's like about, you know, influence and we do one thing and, you know, all kinds of symbolism. And then um, when it went alone, no. So then we'll bring in both of my husbands. So my second husband was a fisherman. And what I didn't realize until going to a lake with him is that ripple means a fish yeah. is under there. <laughs> and it's even possible that the people that judged it and gave it that high score were people that like to fish and, and, you know, so that got them excited. I don't know, but yeah, that, uh, whatever we experience, if I'm hearing you right. So we're, we're unearthing something that feels right for us. And the viewer is going to have its, their own interpretation. And I'm also suggesting, and that can change over time. It definitely could change. And there's universal connection too. What does that mean? Uh, It comes from Jungian psychology that there are universal symbols that we're all connected to Mm. in our dreams. And you would see this in art movements, like the Impressionists, all of a sudden there was this art movement that changed art that happens. I think unconsciously we're all gravitate towards something new together Mm. as a group kind of like what's happening now in our digital era. Right. We're all being propelled here together. Right, right. I've often thought um, what I thought was a new idea. I One of my um, images I use a lot, um, business cards and things is it's, it's a little boy at the beach holding his daddy's legs and it's just the boy in the legs. And it did well in competition and people always love that image and I thought it was a new thought and then the next year in print competition there were a bunch of images like that and I don't really think that people saw mine and copied I think it was that as you call it universal mind yeah the universal unconscious we are connected and maybe even if they did it may not have been in the forefront of their mind but somewhere in the back of their mind, when they go to the beach, you're like, oh, I have this idea. I want right. to create a photo. And it it may not register that this was Lucy's photo, but something connected them emotionally to that imagery that they want to recreate it. Right. And, and I might have, sorry. Never be the same as yours. No. You will always have minute changes. And and what sticks for one person might not for another person. Another person might have saw that like, oh, that's a beautiful photo, but that doesn't stick for me. And that's okay. I, I find this very fascinating. Mm-hmm. I do too. I, and I might have what gotten the idea for that from something I don't even remember. So it sure probably wasn't an original thought, just that I somewhere in the archives of my visual memory there was that thought of, ooh, why don't I get really close and take a picture of just the little dude here? So, yeah. Right. Yeah. And what's original is you in that moment taking that photograph and editing it. That will always be original. Right. Right. Or letting my lab edit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back in the, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I was the last person in California to give up her film camera. And it wasn't until uh, the lab closed that I loved oh. and and I couldn't find people to print my work without it being scanned first. And I just didn't want to go through all that anymore. But um, yeah, I'm glad I did. Okay, let's see. Um, so what do you mean by pushing the artistic potential? So let's say you've got an image and you're like, that's nice, but I want to push the artistic potential. <laughs> so tell me, you know, I know you don't think about it in that, you know, step-by-step step way, but I'd love to know your thinking on that. Um, I love to see where we can go digitally 
where our softwares are capable at this point. You know, mm -hmm. I would love to see our softwares evolve even more. And they are, I mean, this is why Photoshop's always being updated every, seems like every couple of weeks. Um, sorry. I guess my dog wants to get on the interview. <laughs> um, <laughs> Something went wrong. Oh, just, and did you hear my television? My television's oh. talking to me now. <laughs> okay. I, so. I'd like to see what we can do in, in these um, different developing softwares. Ah. You know, where can we take these photos? Is it beyond, you know, for me, it started with exposure correction and then color correction. And then what if I did this? And from there, it went all the way to if I just smeared the pixels with a digital brush, look what happens. Mm -hmm. And then I, I couldn't stop I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing mm -hmm. so similar experiences when I discovered the SX70 film and cameras did you ever play with SX70 no. film so it was the original um the original Polaroid where it would shoot out and you'd watch it develop in front of you as opposed to waiting and then uh -huh. peeling and the inks uh -huh stayed soft for a period of time if you kept oh, it yeah, warm you can manipulate them. so yeah so i would take uh like my uh, ups back when we had to sign uh on a little device those ups uh pin stylists i would i would borrow those from my ups driver <laughs> i'm like can i have a couple more and you could push the inks around and so uh -huh. in that medium, you know, we were, there was like this whole, I don't know, crew of junkies, basically SS, SX70 junkies, where we were discovering how far we could push that medium and it became its own art form for a time. And for me, yeah. I was always, you know, I've got, I've got a painter's soul but not the patience. <laughs> so this gave me that ability to take an image, this is pre-digital, and turn it into what felt like the painting I would paint if I was painting that. So yeah. am I, is that what you're talking about? Like, here's the medium and I'm a, we pushed sure. it to see what else could be done? Right, so, um, you know, there are pioneers before me who, who have already been doing this taking a, a digital photo and then um, pushing the pixels to make it look painterly. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just fell in love with that. I tried to learn as much as I can and then kind of develop my own style of interest in it where um, my style is more expressionism where I, I want to evoke more emotion than the painting realism of the photo. So I, I like to add more layers, splashes, Pardon? So tell me more about what you just said. Expressionism, you love to say that again. And the expressionist movement, they they wanted to evoke what was most important for them was to evoke emotion looking okay. at their art, okay. regardless of the pictorial correction of the art. Got so it. if you're painting a flower, the Renaissance wanted the flower to look as photorealistic as possible before mm -hmm. photos were around. Um, the expressionists wanted you to feel something when you looked at the flower. And that way they will manipulate the paint even more, either it will have drips or splashes or augment it even more. So emotion is pulled out from people. Mm. Okay. Who's a famous expressionist? I know the impressionists. But the ex oh, yeah, you just caught me. Okay, off when it pops in, um, I see the imagery. Yeah. Well, let's move I'll on, and, and that. if you remember, be like, yeah. "Hey, I got it." Um, yeah. All right. So, so I think like Gauguin and Picasso. Well, Picasso's more Cubism, but that those kind of okay. artists, those who okay. were rep representing realism taking yes. art in a whole nother direction yeah so like impressionist uh they were uh had a certain style that that didn't look like photorealism 
and then expression right. they was took fast. They enough. wanted to capture light in the moment. Right. And then, and then expressionists they, yeah. pushed. Sorry, I don't mean to talk yeah. over you. Um, but expressionists then were the people that then were like, oh, let's move things around. Let's let's not even worry about if it looks like it could be real. I was looking at one of your uh pieces of art on your website and there's no way that those people or things or whatever could fly all like you could never capture <laughs> that uh w in life but the emotion that it evokes is fantastic yes I, is that right am i kind of right on yeah. Track? Yeah. yeah yeah like let's throw out all the hey uh nobody would have two eyes on the side of their face and right. and be like let's see what we feel when there's two eyes on the side of the face or there's an angel floating through the air or, or whatever am i right. yeah am i kind of on track yeah yeah great so this brings me to this podcast is called the profitable photographer so um, like I have friends who have retired and they're going like way deep into creating art digitally and composites and different things. Um, they're not selling their work. They don't care. How do you feel that exploring the potentials um, and what did you say? Pushing the artistic potential might translate into profitability for photographers or or can it no it certainly can i mean there's there's websites out there that could help you as a traditional photographer um in traditional i mean taking a photo and having it more look like photo realism and then also for photographers who want to push more of that artistic direction you could sell your work online, um, like Fine Art America, where people can find you and, and purchase the print on a canvas. Or if you want to get into mugs and pillows and things like that for your art too, you can mm -hmm. choose that route too. Uh, also in the digital era, you could study NFTs, um, selling your digital art versus uh, with cryptocurrency. Um, there's a lot to that to explain, and I, I'm probably not the best person to talk because I don't fully understand it yet, but basically when someone buys your art and then sells it, the digital version, you keep making money off of it. So okay. there's a, a lot to learn in, in that route. Selling your work online, putting up a, a website and having people buy prints is also a way to go. Okay. Um. So... Do you think, like, I have a th thoughts on this, um, and I noticed if I was looking at your client website, there, I didn't see any digital, any art on there. Am I, was I looking at the, mm -hmm. the right yep. one? Is there a reason you don't show the potential of what you could do while you keep them separate? I think for me right now, um, I I like when they hire me to do senior photos or family photos, they are getting the photographer part of myself. Okay. And I will take them through that journey with me, um, pre-session, taking the photos and then in-person sales and selling the, the photo products. The other side of me is the digital artist. And I like to have those two separated and you can you could totally put those two together and sell your clients a digital painted version. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want that right now because I want to give myself as much freedom as I can in my creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I, I just, I enjoy the exploration and I don't want necessarily a client being like, well, I, I wish you didn't paint it that far or could you pull it back or, you know, all those yeah. things clients are going to say. Um, and I don't want to fall out of love in it. So that's why I want to keep it my own separate. This is just for me right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I do think there's potential for some people to show some of uh, 
the art just to separate us from other people in our community that are doing very nice sure. portrait work, for example. Um, like I used to um, show the real black and white with little spot color. And now I guess it, that's become like an evil thing to do. <laughs> but before you could do it in Photoshop, you had to do it by hand. Uh -huh. And I would show yeah. that and people would hire me because they saw something different, but then they always ended up buying the pure black and white with no color, even though they thought sure. they wanted that. But yeah, I that that helps me think about um, it, it, like you, you don't have to blend them together. Uh, you can have your art and do what you do. Like I've always been like, okay, my my nature travel flower photography should I put that on my website I I do have a little um you know I call it personal work just to enhance that I'm a creative person sure but um to if we were going to sell that you definitely tell me if you agree with that wouldn't want to put them on the same website if you were sure. that you wouldn't want a shopping cart for your super expressionist images on your portrait website. Right, you just you don't want to confuse the consumer. Right. You want right. to streamline them to what you want them to look at and, and buy. It's just like someone who does boudoir photography and family photography, you probably don't want to put those two on your same mm -hmm. website, but it, it makes more sense to have two separate websites for those two entities. Right, right. Well, and I imagine that the work you do digitally enhances or grows your visual brain so that your portrait photography is stronger and stronger. Yes, absolutely. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. How I frame the photo, how I think most importantly, how I take creative risks. Mm. Um, when I, you know, there's certain portraits I know I want to get for each senior or, or families. I know I want to nail certain ones. And usually within the 10, first 10 minutes when I know I've gotten those, mm -hmm. I allow myself to be take more creative risk. And if I don't make a great shot with it, that's fine. But I'm learning. And maybe the next time when I try it, I will nail that shot. Mm. Yeah. That, that um, yeah, makes total sense. When I was switching from, or say when I was doing wedding photography I made sure I had my checklist and I got all of the things I needed to and then I always was like okay what else can I do that's more creative and unexpected yeah. and then part of why I had to quit weddings is that then my repertoire of things I wanted to do became so long that I wore myself out and I wore my <laughs> couples and families out doing because then they became normal right. kinds of things. Like with portraits, it might be everyone jumping. Uh, and then at a certain point now, everybody needs to jump in my pictures or it doesn't feel like I did my job. So I don't know if that right. made any sense at all. Did that make any right, sense right. at all, Carly? <laughs> it makes sense. Good. All right. Um let me see if I had any other questions here specifically. Um, so do you have any, like my clients like step-by-step, -step, not my clients, but my listeners, I've heard like some doable action steps. And I'm not sure if you can, but since you yeah. do teach digital art, maybe you have some step-by-step um, tips let's say you've got a photograph and you're like I'm gonna work on this I want to change it into something painterly so yes. I have a freebie for your clients is uh, the first step is to choose the right photograph I, I learned the hard way not all photographs are able to make a good photo painting even if you love the photo even if you push it and push it it's not going to work and 
um, there are certain things you need to look at the photograph even more so with an artistic eye than with a photographer's eye. Mm -hmm. um, we all know that we don't want to clip our, our highlights or our blacks. That's even more true of photo painting because when you start pushing those pixels, it will even create a dead spot on your photo painting mm. completely because you're pushing a whole bunch of dead spots together. And then you have this like black hole in your painting or this white hole in your painting. So certain tips like that, how do you choose the right photo that is going to make a, a good digital photo painting is really essential. Okay. Um, once you find the photo, the next step or the next big tip is to test your digital brushes. So there's a wide range of brushes that replicate fine art material. Do you want it to look soft and painterly like a Renaissance painting, or do you want it to look impressionistic fast and, and uh, have that kind of moverly painting? Um, and that all the term that is determined by the brush you choose. And then once you choose the brush, um, how you paint those pixels is where you're going to put your artistic flair into your digital painting. So um, how you go to paint the contours of the face or the tree behind the person all determines how the, the, the movement and the expressionism in the painting is going to flow. And that's, that's, that's the part where I get most excited and, and mm. the art becomes alive just on your interpretation of that movement. What makes digital photo painting so accessible for everyone is that you don't have to think about the form, you don't have to draw a person, you don't have to think even of color and mixing because it's all coming from the photo. It's all being mm. replicated from the photo itself. What you get to choose is your brush. How big or small are you go to push those pixels? How are you going to move those pixels? How are you going to express yourself in that movement? And then mm -hmm. you could add layers upon layers upon layers. And all of a sudden, it just takes on its own artistic form. Mm. Now, if you were going to bring in other elements and do composites, how do you think about, like, what else could I put in here? What's the story? Like, how do you think about that? And not so just composite. randomly, like, oh, let's put an angel in there. Or let's, or let's put a dog, great. Right. Um, composites are the, their own little tricky um, beast because when you create a composite, you have to think of some fundamental art that makes sense for the finished piece to look like a unified image that doesn't okay. look like you threw a whole bunch of different um, elements together. Perspective has to be nailed on. So if you have your base photo and is of a horizon line that is, let's use rules of third, it's on the bottom third of the painting, mm -hmm. then everything that you're gonna put into that to make it look like a composite has to have that horizon line at that same spot. Or your human's gonna look off or your angel's gonna look off because maybe you photograph the angel looking down but you're putting it up in your picture so that mm -hmm. something's always, People are going to look at it like something's a little off. Mm -hmm. um, so the perspective's important. Color harmony is also important. Um, looking at different composites, putting things together. Do the reds match up? Do the greens match up? And mm. that, it sounds easy, but it's really hard to match different photos, color tonality with it. And then um, you need the correct exposure with all the imagery. If, if the whites are too white on one and muted on another one, that's not all gonna match up. So there's some fundamental things you, you need to do to create the composite. But once you get it all figured out and you create the composite, then you can create one unified image. And if you wanna take that one step further and do a photo painting with it, you can. This is why sometimes it takes me weeks to create one image where you, it's a labor of love and expression to put it all together. Mm -hmm. And not all images are going to work. And I think part of the artistry is to let the imagery wander. Um, mm. So the piece you were talking about, the dancers on the windmill, mm -hmm. I never wanted a windmill. I wanted wind chimes. And mm. I could never find an image of wind chimes that I had this vision in my head. It would, just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I don't live in a place where I could just throw up these wind chimes and 
create a photo of it, that was that's another option. But I, the street in my head and the vision in my head just didn't exist yet. So as I was looking for wind chimes, windmills kept showing up, mm. and that took the whole art in another direction. Mm. So sometimes, like I say, the images come to you as much as you're going to them. Mm. And it, we're allowed to meander with them and start playing with them. This disco the worker is not. Um, part of being an artist is also have a discerning eye of taking things out that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. so, so what that makes me think of is um, at a certain point in my photography career, I realized there are generally photographers who like to create an image and photographers that like to find an image. Mm -hmm. And even though, let's say I'm doing a family session and we plan the location and the clothing and the time of day I'm not sketching out exactly who's going to stand where and what rock I'm finding the images whereas one of my mentors uh Ken Whitmire he finds out the height he goes and scouts he he takes pictures he draws it up and when he gets to the session he places people exactly where he planned. Right. And um, and both are really successful. You know, right. I'm sure he does a few found ones, but I'm also thinking of like uh, a friend, Mark Brandis. He has this amazing photograph. Uh, well, anyway, he, he had a degree in commercial photography. So some of his portrait work was planned you know like painted a certain background got a checkerboard bought a chair and set everything up so how where I'm going with that is it sounds like it, with digital painting there can be the okay I've got an idea in my head I'm going to do that uh, uh -huh. a friend of mine Judy she's got a girl running away with a big fluffy red dress and she has an image that she's running through the streets of Italy oh. so she has a pre idea whereas what I heard about the windmills is you sort of find and explore and discover and add and take away and refine yeah. and you don't have an end exactly in your mind when you start am I am I on track yeah, I think both of us, both parts are in all of us as artists. We sometimes yes. have a vision and I know I work best more organically in the moment with people. I, I work best feeding off the energy of what the person comes with and my surroundings and seeing the light in that moment as a photographer. And then other times I work best when I do plan a concept and, and go find what I need for it. Mm -hmm. I think all of it's part of us and some of us just sit more comfortable in one lane than the other and mm -hmm. all's okay mm -hmm. oh yeah there's no judgment yeah. um yeah but I'm, I'm thinking about it in the world of i'm sitting down with a photograph and i'm going to do an artistic something that i'm guessing there are people that lean more towards they already have an idea and others yeah. that lean towards i'm going to see where this goes yeah yeah yeah. So that kind of frees me a little bit <laughs> because I always kind of thought I needed to kind of know what I wanted to do with digital art. Um, no. But no. Oh, ooh, this is so good. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having a completely new conversation uh, yeah. and opening my mind up to um, things that totally make sense, like we're in a renaissance and we're not just you know throwing that oh it's a renaissance but like truly like in the renaissance there was just everything opened up in in all ways science art um yeah music everything and that's where we are now because we have new tools so yeah, yeah pretty mind-blowing okay so i have two questions for you Number one, I know you have uh, something you would love to offer as a gift. So what is that and how do they find it? 
Yep, I, I'll have a link that they could uh, click on. It's uh, five strategies for choosing the perfect photo for your digital painting. So I'll go through what you need to really look at in a discerning eye to see if this photo is going to work. It could be one of your own, or you can find a stock image to practice with. All are okay. Um, but when you're looking at imagery, you'll start to see what's going to work and what's not going to work. Okay. And... So it's paintedcamera.com slash the number five strategies mm -hmm. choosing photos. Choose and that is in the show them. notes. And again, you can find the show notes in YouTube if you go there too. Um, but you can also see Carly's beautiful smile and me worrying about the light on my face and it, what my bangs are doing. <laughs> I'm, I'm bang phobic if people have listened for a while they know that so all right question number two um is there either something that you would love to share that you haven't yet or a thought to leave us with um yeah it would go back to where we began that art is powerful and your photography is your visual narrative mm. and how you choose to express that in the world um you have every right that's your birthright to figure out how you want to present that to the world so i, I just want to empower people to keep expressing themselves in any way they want to if they want to try digital art that's wonderful if they don't that's wonderful too um, but just keep listening to the images and the way you want to tackle this art and keep going in that direction I love it. Thank you, Carly. I know people are going to love this. And I particularly have a group of friends that uh, this group's been going for 35 years. And the 50 members, almost all of them are getting into digital art a lot. So I'm going to make sure they listen to this. A lot of them oh, don't I, ever care about selling their work, but they spend hours and hours and hours at the computer. So really yeah. fun to have a different conversation. Um, and I feel really inspired. Like maybe I want to learn more or take your class or something and, and, you know, Exciting. dig into the artist in me that has not, um, uh, had uh much energy lately like my artistry has been talking lately <laughs> either yeah. coaching or yep. yeah so thank you for inspiring me and I know the listeners are super inspired um so thank you so much Carly you're welcome thank you for having me you're welcome and stay tuned for my wrap-up everyone bye for now bye Right. Thanks for coming back or staying with me for the wrap up. And also, again, thanks for subscribing on YouTube. The, the more this little fun adventure of also trying to make my visuals not super messy <laughs> uh, and letting the perfect imperfection shine through. Uh, the more we do that, the more um, this knowledge that my guests are sharing from their you know just as volunteers no one gets paid <laughs> um the more people will be impacted by what people share so thanks for doing that and uh, let's see this was kind of hard for me to summarize but i love uh that she shared that we are in this new renaissance because the world has changed and so what we have in terms of technology and tools to create, create art, create everything has just exploded. And digital painting is one of those avenues that wasn't available before that can be um, just, you know, like a whole new world of expression. And I love where she said that... Um, what did I say? Well, I was asking her where she gets her ideas or where you learn about art and symbolism. And she talked about making sure you spend time within, you know, know yourself, know your visual 
uh, preferences um, have it mean something to us and not necessarily like the art world says something means something, um, but it's our expression. Um, I asked her about selling our art and she mentioned that you can go to Fine Art America and be listed there. I'm not sure what the world of NFTs are right now with cryptocurrency going wild. Um, we discussed the question of whether to put your art on your business website, let's say your portrait or wedding photographer, um, whether or not to offer painted art. And her choice is to keep them separate so that she doesn't... Um, she doesn't mix what she's doing kind of, I'm just paraphrasing, but out of the depths of her own soul and her creativity and what she's doing for her clients and pleasing clients. And then we did a little step-by-step -step of how do you start doing a photo painting? And she said, first, you have to make sure it's the right photograph, the highlights and shadows, and I imagine other aspects need to be there. Ooh, there's a little bright reflection. Okay, I'm going to scoot over here. Um, and you choose your brushes, and that impacts how an image is going to look. Um, you want to make sure when you're doing composites that everything blends in a way that makes sense. You know, like if a person is standing next to a boat, uh, the boat should be bigger than the person visually maybe unless it's a very small boat <laughs> um we want to learn about colors and choose colors um use color oh i know what she said is the nice thing about digital art is we don't have to come up with the colors we've got raw material right there to use um so that is my little tips, but so much more. And I'm really glad um, that I had a chance to have this conversation with her. And um, yeah, that's it. So uh, my dad used to say, see you in the funny pages. <laughs> Bye for now.